In Henry VI, Shakespeare famously wrote, the first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. But if we did, Broadway would cease to exist. When it comes to a show, most theatergoers are familiar with the tasks of directors, writers, actors, even agents and producers. But theatrical lawyers are the true powers on Broadway. They negotiate rights and contracts, deal with unions and licensees, reevaluate royalty pools, and do a lot of handholding. All the while making sure the art of the deal is alive and well along the Great White Way. I'm Patrick Pacheco of New York One and the Los Angeles Times for the American Theatre Wing. And I'm delighted to welcome three of Broadway's super lawyers to working in the theater. Elliot Brown is a partner with Franklin, Wine, Rib, Rudell, and Vassallo. Among the Broadway and off-Broadway shows he has represented are Tommy, Death of a Salesman, the producers Young Frankenstein, Legally Blonde, Catch Me If You Can, and the current revival of Evita. Seth Gelblum, a partner at Loeb and & Loeb and chair of their theater practice group, has a wide range of clients, including producer Scott Rudin, playwright David Henry Wong, directors Julie Taymor and George C. Wolf. He is also the go-to liaison between Hollywood and Broadway who helped navigate the early days of Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark. His latest involvement is the just announced Lucky Guy, which will star Tom Hanks in his Broadway debut this spring and be directed by George C. Wolf. And Nancy Rose is a founding partner of Shrek, Rose, DePello and Adams, who helped clear the way for the Broadway smash Wicked to hit the stage. She has also worked on the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Three Days of Rain, which starred Julia Roberts, The Vagina Monologues, and Next to Normal. Welcome all, and thank you for joining us. I wanted to start the conversation by asking you, what personality trait has held you in best stead as a theatrical lawyer, and how did you learn that particular lesson? I think that to be successful in the theater, you have to understand that it is a back-end business, that no one makes money unless everyone makes money. The show succeeds. The upfront money is not important. And so, so much of what we all do is explain to our clients that each participant in a production has got to be sufficiently incentivized to move forward, but understanding that that means all of them, that each party wants to make sure they're getting paid appropriately. We have to understand that everyone else is also waiting for their reward in the hereafter. It has to work for everybody. And that is important when you're representing the producer or you're representing the artist. There has to be a structure which permits everybody to succeed in success. And I think that's the, the issue we face on every new project. Nancy, I mean, you had a lot of creative artists. Um, is honesty with them a big part of it, or what? Oh, they? absolutely. You must be honest with your client. They think they really expect it. I came to the theater, um, I used to perform when I was younger. I sang, I acted, I was Nancy and Oliver, and Annie and Annie Get Your Gun. I had this low, belty, alto voice, and <laughs> but I didn't have the guts to pursue it. Um, so the next best thing for me was becoming a theater lawyer. Um, and we used to make a pilgrimage to New York every year from Baltimore and now being a part of creating shows and producing them throughout the world is a great thrill. But I think your clients expect you to be honest. They wanna hear the brutal honest truth. And your sister's also a producer, is she not? Yes, she She's is, yes she is. She first produced Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat in 1981 or 82, and at the time I was in law school, and I watched her producing this fantastic show, and she had a theater lawyer, his name was Leonard Collini, and I watched from the sidelines, and I thought, wait a minute, I wanna do this. So I really got into the theater due to Susan. Elliot? Well, you asked about a personality trait. Uh -huh. I like my clients, I've always <laughs> liked my clients, and in fact, uh, I've been known to say to a potential client, if you need a tough guy lawyer, I'll have to find one for you because it's not me. <laughs> but I've also generally liked the people on the other side and generally like the people in the theater. It's like being a small town lawyer. And since I'm from a small town, that's always worked for me. I mean, when you talk about handholding, that's my favorite part. I mean, in my practice, nobody goes to jail, nobody gets divorced, nobody loses custody of the children. They get mad, they fire me. Okay, but... 
We're so used to the modifier cutthroat before the, the, the noun lawyer. Is that how you differ from your uh, no, it's professional? How I, it's place? how I differ from Seth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, one of the people that you mentioned in the initial recitation uh, was someone I had an interesting conversation with along the lines that Elliot was saying. Um, it was a producer who had, um, was being treated very badly by some writers in terms of rights issues. And I said to this person that if you want to be treated fairly and someone who will assert your rights, we will absolutely do that. If you want to do damage to these people and to their careers because of what they did, then you'll have to find another lawyer because that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're wrong here. I think they're behaving badly and you should absolutely assert your rights, but that does not mean that you have to go overboard with this. And I completely agree with Elliot that um, it is this aspect of what is fair and appropriate and for all these people who we are rooting for is crucial to what we do. Civility, uh, you know. Well, I, I was going to say it. I mean, for me, that's all I've ever really cared about. You don't find it all the time, but at bar association conferences, <clears throat> at ethics conferences, I mean, I can count on one hand the number of times I raised my voice in 37 years because it doesn't. It makes me feel bad <laughs> to do it. But civility is crucial, and I think you can find civility more in a theater practice than in any other kind of either entertainment practice or any other kind of practice except maybe trust in the states, which is what I would do if I couldn't be an entertainment lawyer because having dead clients sounds okay too. Yeah. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody outside the theater comes in, you know, all barrels blazing and they're sort of shown, we don't work this way? You made the reference to the studios getting involved. Right, yeah. And it's not exactly coming in all barrels blazing, but it is such a different model in the movie business. In the movie business, they pay substantial fees up front, and in return, they control everything. They own everything, they have final approvals on everything. In the theater, the authors have approval over the rest of the creative team, over changes to their work. They end up owning the work and controlling future dispositions, rights to the work. The director has approvals. Um, the studios have been, it's always been a great surprise to them when they encounter this. And what was interesting is that uh, a few years ago, we were able to work out and arrange with the Dramatist Guild, um, whereby the, the studio, faced with the prospect of adapting one of their own movies for a musical, and then being told that that's all well and good, but once you stop producing the play, your production rights expire, those three people you have chose to, chosen to use to write this play, this musical, will then own it. You'll share in the revenue for a while and then you won't share anymore. When the studios heard that model, they said, how can this be? This is our property. We're spending, we spent all the money to create the movie. We're spending money on this. I said, the reason is that these people make almost no money working for this thing for years. And in success, they will reap those rewards. If you want to switch that model and pay them a lot more money up front, we can adjust that. And what we ended up with was a model whereby they pay a lot more money up front, and then if they want to have an enhanced participation, an awful lot more than that after the show opens, and then in return, they do not own it or control it. They share control with the authors and have, get 50% of the subsequent revenue forever. So even in that situation, they don't, the movie model doesn't prevail, um, but it was a big surprise to them to understand this. And I had to explain to them every step of the way, if you were doing a movie, even this enhanced amount you're paying them would be such a fraction of the amount you would be paying to in, de in the development of a movie. Yeah. And I think that they have all come around to acknowledge that it is a different model and they're willing to abide by it. So I saw that they came in it, with a ruthless frame of mind, but they came in with a very different model in mind, and they had to learn that 
This is a, this is a, a different business, a different structure. Well, this, the, go the theater is very collaborative, so you you have to end up working with your collaborators every day, the director, the producer, the author, the designers. So if you come in with a ruthless attitude, it, it, it's very difficult to, um, to work with, with your collaborators after that. So when we mention civil, I mean, all of us are tough. You know, I'm a tough negotiator. I'm an emotional negotiator. Um, but at the end of the day, you need a fair deal in order for your clients to, to succeed in the environment that they're working in. Uh, that's a good segue, actually, to getting the rights, which I think is probably number one. Your job number one when you're first hired, right? It's getting the rights, it Elliot? Is the most satisfying thing in the world to watch a curtain come up on a musical on opening night and you got a phone call two years before from a producer who said, could you look into these rights for me and see if you can... Two years? <laughs> Five, Three, six, four, seven years? It is, there is, there is <laughs> nothing, nothing more satisfying than seeing, than knowing that there's hundreds and hundreds of people working on something great and that you were the first, you made the first phone call. I mean, that's the best part. So that had a point, right? I mean, you got the right. I to said die. two years. I should. <laughs> how many? How many, how many <laughs> no, years? nine. Nine was different. No, from the time Maury Yeston played the Italians at the Spa in a Chinese restaurant just above Washington Square Park, to when the show opened on Broadway, was about five and a half months. It was. I've never had anything like wow. that ever in my Tommy. This is nineteen. 80? 80. 80 well, it opened in May of 82, so this must be, yeah. this has to be a, around um, October of 1981. Uh -huh. Tommy Toon said he wanted to do it. Harvey Claris and uh, Michael Stewart wanted to produce it. Sam Cohn was behind it. And a week later, I was on a plane with another lawyer to Rome to <laughs> get the rights from Fellini and Rondi and the other guys who wrote Eight and a Half. It was the greatest business trip of my life. And, and, uh, and, but that that no show that no shows ever move forward like that. Why did it move so fast? It was just <laughs> Harvey could raise the money. Uh -huh. Tommy wanted to do it. Sam was behind it. In those days, not only were theaters available, right. there were empty theaters. I mean, it was incredible in those days. And that's why the Mark Hellinger Theater, one of the most beautiful theaters in the world, is a church because of those terrible. Mm -hmm days on Broadway, I mean, it's unimaginable to younger lawyers now that, that there was a day when there weren't three or four shows in line for each theater on Broadway, but, you know, the stars aligned on that show. It won the Tony. I mean, yeah, be, be know, Dream Girls. It be Dream Girls. Raul well, Joyo was fantastic. Yeah. One of the reasons it must have happened was how much did it cost? You know, it's, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I, think, I think that nine was... was 1.8 million or 1.9 wow. million wow. dollars. And now you say to someone, I'm doing a really inexpensive musical. It's only eight and a half million. Really? And then the first one I did myself, all by myself, was Barnum. And I think that that was one or 1.2 million. So I'm probably, maybe nine was less than 1.8. Maybe it was only 1.5 or 1.6 million dollars. It would be interesting to Incredible. track the rise. I remember yeah. that uh, Jerome Robbins Broadway was seven and a quarter in 89 or something and that was the, that was then the biggest. no one could believe it that's right <laughs> yeah. and it just now we're up to you know so much more what has been a sticky situation in terms of getting the rights to a show that you may have been involved with something that that went through a lot of different changes perhaps uh certainly in general jukebox musicals must be difficult because there are so many different writers perhaps behind songs. That's dealing with the music publishers is, mm -hmm. is the biggest issue. And um, that can be difficult because the music publishers do not engage in licensing for stage rights as their core business. Mm. <laughs> and so they are a little uncomfortable with it. Um, they certainly know more about it than they used to because there have been so many more shows like this. But um, that can be a laborious process of making that deal. Um, but that's really the, that, that's the only complicating factor with that. You're dealing with people who are not in the the theater business. You both were. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, unless you're asking about when a show is a big hit, somebody always appears and claims they wrote it. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that what you mean? Yeah. Pardon? That's a different issue that, much, that yeah. we're going to get to. Okay. But yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. They never do it when it's a flop, right? It's only no, no. They only wrote it when it's a big hit. That's right. When there's yeah. lots of money. And yeah. talking about big hits, you both worked on Wicked, I believe. 
right? And right. I think well, you've got Seth is production counsel, and I represent uh, uh, Stephen Schwartz, who yeah. wrote the music and lyrics, and Mark Platt and David Stone. And it's actually an interesting story about how it all came together. I just also work with the book writer. I, oh, so you also represent three, the right. book writers. That's right. Um, uh, let's let's say the name of the, the, the oh, book Winnie writer. Holtzman. Winnie Holtzman. Winnie Holtzman. Winnie Holtzman. Right. So um, Stephen Schwartz, uh, client called and uh, he called in I think it was 1998, 1999 and said, <laughs> Nancy, I read a great book. It's called Wicked by Gregory Maguire. Universal's developing it as a movie and I know that it, that it, it can be a great musical. Can you get me the rights? I thought about it and of course, you know, that's what we do. We get the rights and I thought, well, should I call Business Affairs at Universal because I know those guys. And then I had an idea to call Mark Platt. Uh, Mark Platt uh, had an overall deal at Universal, and he used to be the president of production at Universal and then also at Columbia Pictures. Mm. And I thought, so many musicals don't do well because the book, you know, the book isn't very good or the book is, uh, is uh, not structured well. And I thought, with all of Mark's experience in the movie business, he had done some fantastic movies, that he would be a great contribution to the, to the, to the project. So I called Mark, and he was interested. And it's funny because coincidentally, Mark and I grew up together. Uh, we went to a junior high and high school together, and we were actually in Oliver in ninth grade together. So we had this little theater <laughs> you connection. Bill Sykes or something? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> I think maybe he was the Artful Dodger. But um, mm -hmm. Mark is we a very had nice this. Man. He would have played Bill Sykes. <laughs> <laughs> we had this great theater connection, and um, so anyway, so when I called him to say, "Do you want to do theater? Do you want to do a new show with Stephen Schwartz?" He jumped at the chance, and. Actually, Wicked was developed initially under Mark's discretionary fund. Because he had a deal at Universal, he had some money that was set aside that he could use to develop projects that he was interested in doing. So he developed the project. Uh, you know, he paid for the rights and paid, you know, Winnie and Steven out of his discretionary fund. And then at each stage, he would show it to Universal. So we would all go out to Universal and we would sit in a room and Steven and Winnie would play the show for the powers that be at Universal, and it would go back and forth and back and forth until finally Universal said, okay, you have a show here, let's do it. Um, coincidentally, I also introduced Mark Platt to David Stone because, you know, Mark was a, then a, primarily a film producer and David Stone was a theater producer and I thought he needed a partner. Mm. So, um, so that show worked out like that. How, when did you get involved in Wicked, Seth? And, and do you often have to, to do this cross-pollination between what she just described, theater producers yeah, with film producers? I think what Nancy did on that show was very unusual for a theater producer. Nancy really played a crucial role in pulling that one together, and it worked out pretty well. Right, um, but, but part of the reason is that Stephen doesn't have an agent. Stephen right. Schwartz does not have an agent. I'm his sole representative. Uh -huh. So sometimes the agents will play the role in putting together a project. That's I a good see. point. When we, when we have clients who are, don't have agents, then we have to do much more. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember whether I got involved through Universal or Winnie first, I can't remember. Um, there's a law firm in Los Angeles um, who asks me to help them when their clients get involved in the theater and that's how I got to know Winnie. Um, Universal, I was already representing um, two or three of the studios and Universal called me one day saying that we're thinking of getting involved in this. And um, it must have been in this pro during this development process when they hadn't made up their mind yet. And we were having lots of conversations about how these deals are structured, how much the show costs, what a recruitment schedule is like. And I think that that's, that is one of the unusual roles that theater lawyers play in that we're often representing people who are new to the business or have not worked in it for that long. And so we are really providing a great deal of business counsel. Mm -hmm. We know these numbers very well. Um, and they are looking to us for something beyond um, crafting an agreement. They're really looking for judgment, business judgment. And so I remember having a lot of conversations with them, running these numbers. Uh, it was interesting on that show that uh, there was a cap set on the financing and the decision was made that the creative decisions had led to costs that would exceed that budget 
and then there were discussions about how to finance that, and it was, I'm sure you remember that point. Right, I, of course I remember that point, because we were in San Francisco, and I remember Universal came to see it, and they, and they looked at the, at the production in San Francisco, and there wasn't enough scenery on the stage. It was like, if you're going to create the world, we'll really right. create the world. And at the time, they needed another, I don't know if it was $2 million or $4 million to really create the world, to create Oz, and to have all the different special effects. And it turned out that David, uh, David Stone and Mark Platt and John Platt and the Iraqa group ended up raising the rest of that financing. And I'm sure, I'm sure Universal to this day is kicking themselves <laughs> for not, for not, for put, not, for it, not right? putting up well, all the financing. Maybe at the time they well, had a cap, but. In San Francisco, it was not a big hit. Yeah, right. yeah. That's and right. when yeah. it came to New York, it was doing about 90% for several months. Uh -huh. And then in the fall, it went to 100% capacity right. and never looked back. So right. at that time, I, it, it would have been a reasonable decision to make, not right. to put on that extra money, but it was uh, particularly for Universal, who was outside of their comfort zone in terms of experience. Elliot? No, I forgot on Nine, on the show Nine, uh -huh. uh, Paramount was going to produce it with, uh -huh. with the producers who produced it. They did a, a workshop, a classic workshop on the old New Amsterdam roof, which Disney has now made beautiful, but in those days looked like the Johnstown flood had washed through it. You could see the top of the Ziegfeld frescoes, you know, on uh -huh. the top of the wall. And every big shot at Paramount came. Barry Diller came. Um, they, everybody came. And they hated it. They didn't like the show, which, which um, would have set back a normal show by a year or two because they were going to put in a lot of money, but instead it was picked up instead. It's an interesting thing. Business judgment is, is a great point. And what you brought up, Nancy, opinion. Right? Maybe it's not a good book to base on. Maybe it's not a good film. You know, you make that kind of judgment. It's interesting, at that point, when somebody comes to you and say, we're going to do a musical on Titanic, Elliot, um, do, are they asking your opinion whether no, this is a good most idea assuredly, or not? Although I did give my opinion on Titanic. And what, because what was it? I, I was representing Peter Stone and Maury Eston, and uh -huh. I ran into them in front of a theater, and they said to me, we're going to do a musical about the Titanic, and I said, that's a good idea, but I can tell you as a man of the theater that if you're going to do a musical about the Titanic, the Carpathia has to get there on time. And I still <laughs> think that I'm, I still, so that was an exception where I did, I actually put it, never, never give an opinion. But I think that's what, the, what makes your, your profession so fascinating. There are so many different elements to it and so many emotional elements and, and so many business elements as uh, well. I, I mean, I remember you talking about the Titanic. Um, I mean, that was so painful to get to opening the night. deal. Oh, my oh God, just all the things that happened along the way. Horrible. One of there was a, there was I think it was someone I represented who was a producer who was going to be putting a lot of money. He died. suddenly died. He died. He didn't look too good to begin <laughs> with, and then he died. And so all of a sudden there was that scramble. The producers really had a scramble. I believe that the producers actually mortgaged their homes at the end to get that done. And I remember they won the Tony on an opening night. I went out to them. They're still looking pretty drawn, and I said this was too hard. They said, yes, this was too hard. And these are people who just won the Tony Award. I mean, it was, that was a, an ordeal all the way to opening night. I mean, remember? Oh, uh, vividly. Oh, terrible. And, and very well covered. And, and obviously yeah. it was an ordeal getting Spider-Man up. Obviously oh. you were in well, the firing Well, you know, the, what's constantly. interesting about Spider-Man and talking about um, the, the judgment and these issues about the expenses that came up on Wicked, that what happened on Wicked was, I think what the real unfortunate thing was that the lead producer was a man named Tony Adams. Mm -hmm. He had been uh, Blake Edwards. You mean Spider-Man. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah. Spider-Man. Yeah. That um, he had been Tony Adams' um, film producer. When they had done Victor Victoria, he had produced that on Broadway. Right. And Tony was a very good man. And when he was handing the rights agreement to the manager of Bono and Edge to sign it in his apartment here in Manhattan. He had a stroke and died the next day at the age of 50. And it was a terrible thing. And his junior partner, who had never produced anything, became the lead producer. Right. Um, we all urged him to bring an experienced person, and he didn't do it. And he was unwilling to do the key thing the producers have to do when the creative people come to them with a very expensive idea. 
Even if it's a good, a very expensive idea, even if it's a good idea, the producer has to say, that's a great idea, let's do it, but we have to find a, a different way to do it because we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't say the second part of it. He would just say, let's do it. And overrode his general, his general managers, and it just, the costs went spiraling out of control. When, when the all hell was breaking loose on Spider-Man, what was your job number one, Seth? What did you need to do? What, how did you keep it all together? What, what was it, well, what were you called upon to do? I represented investors, um, and I represented Julie Taymor. And so I was doing a lot of things. Um, you have to know that until the falling out between Julie and the producers, um, which was, I guess at this point, it was the uh, spring of 2011, mm -hmm. everyone was working together so hard around the clock to get this done, raising the money, um, doing anything we could because they've been working this thing for seven or eight years and it cost so much money and the new producers who'd come in notwithstanding the subsequent difficulties that Julie and I had with them in the dispute How about Michael Cole and Jerry Harris right? did raise an awful lot of money mm -hmm. to get that thing on um, and so I think there was a tremendous amount of collegiality and good feeling within that group because they did get it on and it was up and running and for certain rights reasons they had to get that play mounted by a certain time and they knew that they would be continuing to work on it the problem was there was so much attention paid to it that it was effectively reviewed long before it was open and twice. Th that's a terrible thing I mean that's the problem with the internet I think the first the first show that was totally a victim of that, I think, was Susical, right. where the word of mouth from out of town via the internet was so terrible, and the show was such a great show that they could never get on their feet. And what do you do? What is your role as lawyers? What, what do you, are you counseling patients? Are you counseling just stick in there, uh, stick with it? Are in you, connection with what? In connection, when a show is in trouble. When a show is in trouble, as the lawyer for the show or a lawyer involved with the creative talent for the show, are you sort of hand-holding, soothing your clients? No one really, no one's Protecting gonna, your clients? No one's gonna call their lawyer, you know, when the show is getting bad, bad word of mouth. I mean, occasionally an actor might call and say, what can I do about these terrible things people are saying about me? But no one's gonna call their lawyer. What they're gonna call their lawyer for, on the show My One and Only, after its previews in Boston, everybody was fired. Everybody was fired, so the, all the contracts for the show every contract for the show had to be done over again. Call your so, lawyer for that, I but that's see. different than bad word of mouth. So much of what we do is so far in advance. There is no that's right. cycle to what we do. We work years in advance of the rights oh. agreements and right, financing. <laughs> when things do go badly, if there are clients with whom we have a particularly close relationship, we will certainly be on the phone with them and commiserating. Right. But it, those are not legal services at that right. point. That point is, the kind of support, emotional support you want to provide to anybody you care about. Right, but I think what we also do is when a show is, is, is uh, not doing particularly well is that you work with the general manager on some sort of waiver formula. You know, what usually mm -hmm. happens is that the producers will come and say, we want to keep the show open for another week or two, or we want to, ha we want to keep the show open and we want to save our money for this ad campaign, and they'll ask everyone to waive. And what we'll do is we'll negotiate some sort of waiver where they'll either waive for a certain number of weeks or they'll defer the royalties for a certain number of weeks and, the, and they'll get them paid back later on out of other revenues. So there is something to be done. It's a question point. of moving the project along, I yes. gather, from what you're saying. Well, but Seth's point's really interesting about lead time because uh, when I said how thrilled I was that I get to make a phone call two or three or four years before, mm -hmm. well, our work could be over a year before the show opens. You know, the offering papers are done, the producer rolls out and raises money, casts the show, rehearses the show, and the show opens. So you go to opening night thinking you worked on this show longer and harder than anyone else. And you're not 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 harder. Okay, as hard <laughs> People as the theater are working pretty hard. As hard but I said what you think to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what you think to okay, yourself. maybe. And you're and you're you're forgotten. <laughs> I mean, right, right. Yeah, Nancy, you mentioned the the two words, general manager, that you probably work with the most. And 
I think a lawyer once told me, once they tell me who the general manager on the show is, it's either going to be an easy job or a hard job. Um, what makes for a good general manager and a good working relationship for you and that general manager? And, and basically, to tell the lay, uh, lay audience, such as myself, what a general manager does is really the nuts and bolts of a show, right, in terms of contracts, payment. General payments. manager will put together the production budget, so mm -hmm. they're really the financial eyes and ears for a show. They'll put together the production budget, the operating budgets, you know, they're the ones who write the checks every week, um, and they're really the, the person who's supposed to tell the producer, no, you can't spend this, yes, you can spend that, and they really need to keep you on budget. Um, what makes for a good relationship between you and, and a general manager? Well, someone who's organized, you know, someone who um, can accept, you know, can, can share responsibility, um, someone who, you know, you can bounce ideas off of. Um, someone who knows when to call you. Yes, yes. Say, someone who understands. Something's come up in an agreement, that I want your input on because if I'd agree to this here, it may have a ripple effect in other contractual relationships. And I think that's one of the great things. And there are several very good general managers now. I mean, it's interesting what Ellie was talking about before when there was that one of those rare periods when they're open theaters. I think the last time that happened was probably like the early 90s. Right. And I noticed that one of the ripple effects of that was we went through a period where there are actually not that many strong experienced general managers. I think that people, there wasn't work to be done. We now are going through a time where there are a number of very good general managers and we all work with them very closely. Um, they're sophisticated. We work out the royalty formulas together um, and if we are in touch with them on a regular basis and they know when to call us and we know when to call them, yeah. mm -hmm. then that's really uh, a productive relationship. Can you give me an example of a situation where a a call was not made when it should have been made, and it developed into problems later on in some way. Can you think of anything off off the? No, that would be more likely. That wouldn't have to do as much with the business as it would have to do with an author saying to you, "Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that I took some stuff from this book <laughs> and put it in my play." That's that's yes. more likely. Or similarly. Yeah they will use material in an ad campaign on a website that no one ra bothered to check with a lawyer and it turns out that it was either uh, offensive to somebody or they didn't have the rights to it and so having someone involved with the production often it's the ad, the advertising agency or the marketing people who have some sophistication on these issues and know when to call. Have any of you ever been involved in a plagiarization suit? Sure. Yeah, with somebody who claimed that a musical was in some way based on their unpublished autobiography. I mean, there's famous ancient cases called um, Arn Arnhem, Arnhem, Arnhem versus Porter, where a guy named Arnhem claimed for, for years, for case after case, that Cole Porter had snuck into his hotel room, opened his trunk, and stolen all the music that became Cole Porter Music, it's quite a famous copyright case. Sounds like a good musical, doesn't but, it? <laughs> but, um, that, but that's, I mean, that would be the circumstance under which it would come up. Somebody would say, you took this from my copyrighted work. You'd see it from time. Right, I mean, I was involved. It, I, it's it's in, a, um, uh, in a musical where there was a folk song <clears throat> that was used, and the, um, the author had grown up listening to this little folk song like it's something that his grandfather used to sing him uh, sing to him and he thought it was really part of the Latin culture and uh, we got a claim letter that no in fact this little folk song you know is belongs to you know X and Y and we ended up hiring um, a music researcher to you know research this folk song and to find out whether it was under copyright or whether it had roots that were that went back years and years and years. And it turned out that, that it did have roots that went back years and years and we were off the hook. But you get claims like that. One of the interesting related issues are life story rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the law in this area, to state it very generally, is that there are certain states that have a descendable right of publicity. So that if you were, uh, a resident of that state at the time of your death, your heirs have the right to protect the use of your name and image. And generally, it doesn't mean that someone cannot be used as a character in a play, 
but you can't use the name or image in the title or in the advertising. And so whenever someone wants to do that, you need to check where the subject was living at the time of their death. Oh. And I will tell you that I've been involved recently with a couple of productions where we found out that the subject had the misfortune or perhaps the misjudgment to <laughs> be living in a state <laughs> of the time that did not protect them. <laughs> and what was interesting, on one of them, the producer said, felt, I don't want to have a problem with the heirs, reached out to them, said, we do not need these rights, we can proceed without them, but we would rather have you feeling positively towards this project, be cooperative, and so offered them, without any need to, half of a full share of what you would ordinarily offer to someone who needed those rights. And I found that that's the area um, where often you need to be particularly careful. I think the copyright issues, unless you're surprised and you didn't know it was embedded in the work, are a little more straightforward and easier to, to determine. There was a famous case of Joe Mantello's direction, I think it was of Love, Valor, Compassion, yes. yeah. down in Florida, right? And I, I, I don't know if you represented Joe Mantello, but you're probably aware of the legal issues, and I suppose that's a time when Joe Mantello called his lawyer, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, or his union. Or yeah, his, well, I mean, yeah. what was interesting, what happened <laughs> yeah. is that had to do with the protection of his direction. That's right. I guess we should give and, a little background right, there's was the, the production. I mean, it's interesting that the Copyright Act lists the specific types of creative work that are subject to copyright. I think most copyright lawyers acknowledge that it's not necessarily an exhaustive list, but, but it does list choreography. It does not list direction. And when this replica production was mounted using his direction, the director's union had the good sense to bring in the designer's union because, of course, the designs were also used uh -huh. And those are copyrightable, clearly copyrightable. Uh -huh. And so they brought a claim, a copyright claim. They brought a claim on behalf of infringement of the copyright of the direction. They were able to make a settlement because they had the strength, the very clear strength of the infringement of the copyright and designs. Um, this has sort of been an ongoing low burner issue in the theater for a while. The director's union very much wants to establish the idea of copyright protection and direction. The Dramatists Guild, the authors, are a little leery of it because they're afraid that it may mean that the directors will claim that part of their contribution, their direction, is being replicated whenever the show is produced in the future. And so the, the, the Dramatists Guild has not necessarily endorsed that idea. I think what's going to happen when it's, when it's really going to come to a head Usually that's going to because there isn't enough money involved for someone to sue. But I think someone's going to do a wonderful, uh, very unusual production of a Shakespeare play. So there's no copyright issue with the author involved. And it's going to be wildly original, place it in some specific time and place. Someone is going to replicate that somewhere. And that director of the original production is going to bring a claim and it's going to be somewhere outside of New York or L.A. where the judges don't deal with a lot of copyright. And some judge is going to say, you know what, that's not fair, that's not right. I believe that's a copyrightable contribution that was such a unique creative, and I'm going to fight for the director here. I think that's what's going to happen. Seth right. understates how strongly the authors feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> when he says they're a little leery, I wouldn't say right. a little leery. I would say up in arms with pitchforks and torches. Right, so. right. <laughs> that's it. Well, there are. I mean, you know, yeah. I can give you, an, like, you know, there's two examples, which is, uh, I remember um, on Teresa Rebeck wrote a play called The Understudy that was mm -hmm. done um, yes. uh, American at Place Theater, uh, yeah, American Place Theater. And at the end of the play, it, it snows. And that was Scott Ellis's idea, you know? But that, yeah, it was his idea and, you know, perhaps part of his direction, but Teresa loves the ending and wants that to be part of her play. Mm -hmm. So if you get into this issue, you know, in terms of what's direction, what's, right. you know, or even in Wicked, where you have at the end of Act One, you have Elphaba and she, and she elevates. You know, she just come, you know, she, she's on a platform and she elevates as opposed to going on a broom. Well, the authors feel that that is a very integral part of the, you know, of the play and would want to keep that, you know, as part of the play forever. 
Right. Um, and is it the play or is it is it direction? So it is. There is a fine line, and the authors feel very strongly about it. What what is happening though? If you have a very prominent director, um, that director will usually say that if I'm going to sign on to this project, particularly on a musical, where they're much more involved in working with the authors on figuring out how to tell the story, that director will be given a share of the author's subsidiary rights revenue in the future, of that author's revenue, mm -hmm. not ownership, not approvals, but a share of that, and in return for that, the authors will have the right to use those elements. Mm -hmm. Now, the drama Guild is unhappy about that encroachment as well, because they're now there are so many directors seek that j as soon as they sign on to a project, and if it's someone who has not necessarily proven that they make that kind of contribution, the drama school doesn't like to give it to them. This is one of the sort of ongoing really difficult issues between the Dramatists Guild and the Directors Union on that very point. Um, there was one show I worked on where it was a very prominent English director who had clearly done this before and I said, ordinarily in this country, someone like you would get this participation. I said, oh no, I, I couldn't ask for that. That would be inappropriate. I said, fine. The show's about to open on Broadway. I said to him, do you still feel you didn't make a contribution here? And he said, well, actually, maybe I did. I contacted the author's representatives the author said absolutely, and they gave it to him. They had no obligation, the show's about to open, because he had earned it at that point. How emotionally involved do you allow yourself to get? When is it beneficial to be emotionally involved, and when does it become detrimental to be emotionally involved? Nancy? Well, you know, I love the theater. I love the clients that I work with. I have a great investment, um, you know, in their success. So I feel emotionally involved in in, in their projects. Um, you know, we we you know we attend. I mean, I generally will go to a reading to hear um, to hear a first play being read, and it's I the will best give. Part. It is the best part. <laughs> yeah. You're exactly right, and it's, I will. It's give, often the best performance. Yeah, That's your first, yeah right. And I will give some comments, and uh, and you know you get to know these clients so well and their families, and uh, that you really are rooting for them. So you have a great emotional investment in their success and the success of that project. Um, you know, the times when it's not, uh, you have to catch yourself is when you're no longer objective and you can no longer advise your client um, to, you know, make a certain decision. But I think that generally um, the emotional investment is, 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 part of, is, is a great part of the job. How do you maintain that um, uh, emotional well, objectivity? Well, I, that's not... That's not exa exactly an issue. I'm not sure I would describe it as an emotional investment, but it probably is because I tend to love my client's work despite what critics say or what my friends say or what my wife says. I tend to <laughs> love the work they do. But that really, I don't think that's really hit me hard in terms of the business part. I mean, the business part is the business part. You have an idea what the deal ought to be or the parameters of where the deal ought to be. I mean, it's part of not yelling yeah. and screaming, I guess, but, you know, I can, be, I can be involved in their work because I like it and I admire what they do so much, but it doesn't have too much of an impact on my representation of them, I don't think. You know, I think that one of the areas where it comes up, and I'm sure you will both agree, is that one of the unfortunate ways in which the theater business has become a little more like the movie business is that in the movie business, there are often many writers who work on a screenplay. Mm -hmm. In the theater business, the writers own the work and have to approve any changes in the work. And you cannot just replace them because they own it. They take their work with them. Um, the Drama Guild form agreement um, does have, give the writer, the, the producer the right to stop working with a particular writer, but then you can't use that person's work. Well, that's never what happens. The person's been working on the show for a long time. You want to, the producer wants to continue to use that work, but feels that writer's not making the necessary remaining changes, and they want to change, bring in another writer or replace that writer, mm -hmm. and you, does not have the right to do so and continue to use that person's work. And the project shuts down while we go through this incredibly painful negotiation, whether you're representing the writer or the producer, because it's very emotional. They've been working together for years, and. It's a very difficult thing, and I think that's when our role is to, particularly when you're representing that writer, 
Um, and by the way, this usually happens when it's not just the producer, but the other, the rest of the creative team, the co-writers of the director, agree a change should be made, which is a but devastating thing for that writer. And trying to negotiate that situation um, and sometimes telling the writer that we can protect your credit, we can protect a good chunk of your um, compensation, but you will need to give up ongoing participation and control and approval over this thing you've worked on all this time if you want this thing to happen at all. Mm. And that is a, that has been happening more and more and I think it's probably the most painful negotiation that any of us ever deal with. But the other side of that coin is the impossible side of the coin. Two writers work together for a year or two and then they come into you and say, how should we divide this? Or they each have their own agent. How should we split this? I was saying, I don't know. Right. How much work did you do and how much work did you do? I mean, that's, that's almost the hardest question that you get. You know, we, we worked on this together, but I did this and he did this. What should the split be? And you can't, right. there's no way to, for a lawyer to say what the split should be. You often work with very demanding people. You work with Scott Rudin, who's one of the most brilliant producers uh, on Broadway, and Lord knows he's demanding. What does he look to you for? What does he want from you in your discussions with him? I think Scott's a sophisticated producer, but what he wants is someone who is familiar with the deals, who can tell him what the normal range is, right. what high and low would be, where do you think you, Scott, where's you, where do you want your offer to be within this range, given who this person is? I mean, I will say that Scott, yep. who can be, you know, a demanding guy. Perfection. Can be, but also can be extremely respectful of people where he will say, I want to pay that person more here. That's inappropriate. For that person, I want to make that option payment higher because I really want to be respectful here. Because hmm. he, he knows, he works with, uh, very gifted people, and he does not want them to feel that he is not acknowledging who they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what he's looking for is what any producer looks for, is for our judgment as to what an appropriate deal would be, what the range would be, what are the ramifications of offering this or that, because as we said in the theater, particularly with, with the royalty structure, what you offer one person can have ramifications on what is paid to other people. And so you work with a lot of obviously creative artists. Yes. And you, you know the pain that they go through because you are going to be an actor. What do they look to from you? What do they look for from you? Is it protection, encouragement? Well, I think they look to, um, protection I think is, is, is uh, certainly at, the, at foremost. I think that they look to feel secure in an insecure world. You know, I think they look to me for um, protection, judgment, um, advice, and they, they like to know that their business is being handled, their legal affairs are being handled, they're protected, and they don't have to worry about that part of it. Um, and I think that there's a great collaboration between lawyers and artists because the lawyers can free up the artists to do their thing you know, which is to create. And knowing, and if you have a great relationship with your lawyer, then you can sit back and you can pursue all of your artistic pursuits knowing that the business and the legal end will be taken care of. Elliot, do, do any of your clients ever say, gee, can I legal, creatively now, when they're writing the script, can I legally do this? I, can, can I, I, I actually can that? answer that question. I mean, <laughs> after living in fear my whole practice of somebody saying, this is my lawyer, he stifles my creativity, but I need him. Um, uh, when a client says to me, I'm writing something, can I do this, can I do that? I always say, write it. Write whatever you wanna write. Do the best you can possibly write it, and then I'll look at it and tell you if you have to take anything out or change anything. The idea of telling somebody in the middle of a creative process not to do something or not to follow some path is madness. I mean, it's one thing if they say, it's, it's one thing if they say, um, uh, I'm, I've used six pages of the Da Vinci Code. I mean, you might be inclined to say, well, you should consider taking all six pages Maybe out. four, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but setting that aside, can I, can I write something about this person? Can I write something about this incident? The answer is write it, write it, write it. And, and 
wasn't there a famous incident, I think, when Michael Bennett actually asked you for a opinion on I told Dream you Girls? That, I told Dream you that story. You told me that story. I was... Um, you want to repeat it for us? I, I, it was so long ago that I'm not even sure if I was admitted to the bar yet, but... It was Dream Girls. I'd been doing a ton of work on Dream Girls. Dream Girls? No, it was Ballroom. I've been, I think, I'd been doing a ton of work on it. Sorry, I can't remember which one it was now. And it, and it did a... Um, a pr whatever you want to call it, an out of town at the at the Shakespeare Theater in Stratford, Connecticut. You remember mm -hmm. that sure. theater in the sure. room? It's not used much anymore, and it's the very first night. And we're in, I'm standing with Michael in the back of the house, and and it's over. And Michael says to me, "What do you think?" He says, "Michael Bennett." Mm -hmm. you know, Michael Bennett, we're talking about a chorus line, the king of Broadway. He says, "What did you think?" And I said, "Michael, I, I've I've been an entertainment lawyer for eight months. I just got out of law school. What do you care what I think?" He got livid. He said, when I ask you what you think, I want to know what you think. He said, you're an audience member. You're looking at this show. Right now, there's possible to make changes in this show. Don't you dare say that to me. You tell me what you think. So I still don't do it much. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I still would only do it with a client who I am totally comfortable with in an incredibly early Stage. I mean, if you sit around and tell anybody what you think at the end of an opening night, you're out of your mind. Right. <laughs> I mean, well, it's too it. late at that point. It is. Yeah. It's too well, late. I think it hurt somebody's supported. feeling. Yeah. But I also think that if the, they do ask us what we think, because we are at readings and we, you know, we'll go out of town, and you want to be what anyone would want to be, which is constructive. You're not going to tell them, "Oh, I think it's terrible." If you think it is, you're going to say, "You know." If I understood this better, it would help me. Um, you know, you, 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 point, you can say things that you think would make it better. Mm -hmm. You don't want to give them an overall evaluation. But I, I do think, I mean, Ellie's absolutely right, that they want to know how another human being responded to the work. What was the biggest kind of turning point, perhaps early on in your career, when you thought, okay, I've earned my stripes on this one? The only thing I can think of is when I was... Um, Maybe I, I was a first or second year out of school, and we were sitting around a table, and um, I was representing um, the estate of Elvis Presley, wow. and uh, with Joe Raskoff, and we went to Las Vegas on that. Right, we went to Las Vegas <laughs> on that show, and I remember was that was this the there was an issue, and I don't, I don't. There was an issue regarding how many number of years. Uh, were left on these for the copyright on these songs, and I remember sitting around the table and and uh, not a great story. Uh, this was all shook up by any chance? No, no, no. no, no. no. no long before that. Long this before is 1982 or 83 or 84. Yeah. I don't know. I'm making you too old. I'm you sorry. are. You are. I am. I'm too sorry, old. but yeah, it's probably 1986. <laughs> was this the thing that right. played at the Beacon? No, it no. played before actually that. at the Hilton. Yes. Okay. And um, in Vegas. It, in Vegas. And it and played it was, here. It opened here. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the three phases of Elvis, that's right. and I remember us trying to figure out the music publishing, but... Yeah, that's that one of the first deals we did. You know, <laughs> it's interesting. I had something happen, which is more a story about another lawyer, which is okay. that the very first set of financing documents I ever prepared um, for a show, um, this would have been, oh my goodness, over 25 years ago. Um, I was looking at them once the show was up and running, and... The New York, State, New York State has specific regulations for theatrical financing. It's mm -hmm. the only state that does, for obvious reasons. The business is here. And so I was learning those regulations. I was drafting these documents on a very expedited basis. And I realized that I had created an ambiguity in the documents, which if certain unlikely events happen, could cause a problem for the producer. And so I remember sitting down with a senior lawyer at the firm that I was at, a man named Ron Conaghy, and the head of our corporate department, and looking at this, deciding what to do. And we realized, okay, you have analyzed it correctly. You didn't draft it correctly, but you did analyze it correctly, <laughs> that this could cause a problem down the road. And Ron closed with the document, he said, you did a good job on this. If this happens down the road, we'll, we'll deal with it then, with the emphasis on we. We. And I looked at that man and I said, that's the fellow yeah, I'm gonna continue I, to work yeah. with. He uh, was, it, was, it was a great experience because I could tell the other lawyer in the room who was not quite, as the quite same attitude, he was a little surprised 
that Ron behaves so well, and I thought, you know, that's, that's how I want to behave with the younger lawyers when I get to be an older lawyer. I, and I it was a, exactly, a great experience for me. Exactly the same story, and I've always tried to do, uh, it was a very senior lawyer, actually a famous entertainment lawyer named Bob Montgomery, mm -hmm. and he had me do a complex partnership agreement while he went to Sag Harbor, and three weeks later, he had it in his hand, and he was looking at it glumly, and he said, well, kiddo, we made a mistake on this document, and we'll have to fix it. And I thought, it's just your story. I'm always going to be like that. It's always, yeah. you know, I'm never going to yell at anybody. So, Nancy, did you have a mentor that, in that way that, that kind of pointed you the way? I know that you even actually worked in... in Foreign relations in DC early Oh, earlier right. On. Yes, I Much did. I, I went to the school of I went to the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and um, I thought that I would pursue a career in in um, international relations or um, diplomacy. And I had uh, worked for Kudair Brothers, and Saul Linowitz was the um, was was the partner there, and he was the partner there in Washington, and. And then and, you switched over. And, and then I switched over to entertainment, and I started working with uh, Bob Levine, who's a mentor to me. And his wife was one of the founders of Ms. Magazine, and he was particularly interested in, in mentoring a young woman. And um, I owe a great deal of debt to Bob Levine. Well, that's a good note uh, to end our discussion on. You're now, obviously, mentors to a whole new generation of lawyers. And from the, from the basis of this conversation, I think they're in pretty good company. Uh, so I'd like to thank each of you for uh, joining us for this stimulating discussion. Didn't get to half of the questions, of course, but um, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theater Wing, I'm Patrick Pacheco, and thanks for joining us for another edition of working in the theater. There is so much more to the American Theater Wing than just the Tony Awards. The American Theater Wing's website has a wealth of information. There's about 700 hours of material on the website. <laughs> 700 hours? That's a lot of material. Here's the jam, everybody. It's free. There are videos, there are podcasts that you can download right onto your iPod. You see artists talking about what inspires them and why they got into the business. It's great to be able to hear people like Stephen Sondheim, Patti Lapone, Doug Wright, Scott Ellis, Donna McKechnie. Programs like Springboard NYC and the Theater Intern Group are great opportunities for young people who are trying to get into the business. The Jonathan Larson grants for new composers are great. And it's just another example of how The Wing is doing wonderful work in fostering the talents of young writers and artists. What the American Theater Wing does with these programs is it emerges immerses you with artists currently working the business. What the wing provides is inspiration. I'm Jen Damiano. I'm Hunter Bell. I'm Bobby Steggert. I'm Saquon Simbla. If you love theater, go to americantheaterwing.org. It's all there on americantheaterwing.org. Click over and check it out. You might learn something.